I'm going to start by saying I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, this is a completely different skill set than the one that I have. <laughs> I'm not a public speaker. I usually have a script. And so this is, I'm leaping off and doing something very bold and daring today for you here. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I, uh, <laughs> I have never ever public spoken in public like this before. And so I think I'm just going to tell you my story. If, if you can't hear me, if I'm not holding the microphone correctly, or if something's gone terribly awry, sorry to jump up here. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think I'm just going to start at the beginning, which is, first of all, I'm from Toronto. I was born here. Yeah, I, um, I was born. I well, I was born in a hospital. Let's see, Mike. But we lived kind of at, at Young and Lawrence area, and then in the annex, and then down at the kind of Queen West area. And I went to Holy Rosary grade school. Anybody? No. Um, and then high school, I was at Cardinal Carter at uh, Young and Shepherd. And uh, we have some Cardinal Carter people. And then, um, and then I went to U of T, and so, uh, yeah. my parents both went to U of T, and, and all of, I went to five, and so, all five of us went to University of Toronto, <laughs> Italian. <laughs> and, um, okay, so, what I wanted to say was that it all began with my parents, really, and, um, and I think a lot of those, especially, you know, the Italians in the audience, but everybody, you know, coming from a solid family background is really, really helpful. And, um, and you can obviously overcome any challenge, but, but it really helps when you've got kind of a safety net at home. And my parents were definitely that kind of emotionally and, and psychologically. They were wonderful. Um, and they really instilled in us what should I say? Let's see. Okay. My dad, uh, my papa, he runs a homeless shelter downtown uh, called the Good Neighbors Club. And it services about 200, 250 guys a day and provides meals and other services to them. And my mom works uh, at the Archdiocese. She's the director of the Office of Research there and, um, and often does think tanks for the UN on things like female genital mutilation or war crimes against women. And, and, and basically, they. They made sure, both of them were immigrants to this country, one from Italy and my mom from the States. Um, and they both got PhDs once they got here. But they made sure that their lives were devoted to giving back to their communities. And so that was kind of what they instilled in us. They, uh, you know, they, they had this very low standard for material success. And we had like no money growing up. And we were like, you know, five kids, and we had like hand-me-downs from the neighbors, and my mom sewed our clothes, and you know, and we gave away our toys to kids who had even less toys than we did, and it was like, it was just, and, but there were five of us, and so we would play all the time, and one of the things that we did was we would put on productions in the living room, we would do like plays, and, and even though we had very little money, they would save it up, and they would take us to the opera, or they would take us to the theater, and they kind of, really emphasize that it was the life of the mind and the life of the heart that were where your treasure lies. And that regardless of your external circumstances, if you have a really stout heart and if you have kind of intellectual riches and, and emotional and spiritual riches, you're going to be fine. And beyond that, you kind of, you know, let us explore whatever we wanted to explore. And all of my siblings are doing vastly different things. One runs the education programs at the ROM, and one is a chaplain in the armed forces, and one uh, runs a group home, and another one uh, does like folklore, and then I'm, you know, in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, and so, so anyway, so that basis, the ideals that they passed down to us were, yes, that, that the important thing was on the inside. Essentially, and uh, and even the experience they gave us with, um, you know, we didn't have like the cool clothes, and the lesson. I mean, I guess that's it. We had adversity when we were young. You go to school and you're not like dressed like all the other kids, and you know, it's not the most pleasant. But you kind of learn self forgiveness, and you learn that like everybody is, you know, it's 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 not based on appearances. 
And um, okay, so that kind of brings me to my job, which is very much based on appearances. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, and I think what's great too today. I mean, I'm learning so much from you guys. And one of the things that's things that's so incredible is that it seems like we're from such disparate fields, but everybody's saying really similar things if you kind of distill what the message is. Um, and one of the reasons I, at first, when I heard I was doing this, I was like, I'm so underqualified, I don't have an MBA, I don't know how to run a business. But I think one of the things that, that is interesting about the job that I'm in is that it's so public. And the awards that you get are very flashy. It's like, it's kind of, it's almost like a metaphor for everybody's job. It's like, if you do something well, you get to have this trophy. Like, that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, or, you know, these kind of amazing paychecks sometimes that happen, or like a red carpet. There are these very really flashy things that happen and punctuate your career. But that can kind of be, anyone's job has that in, in different forms. It's just in, in our field, it's very, you know, they make like a, an award show out of it. <laughs> um, and, and, but I think it's very easy to kind of get lost in that and think that you're heading for a gold trophy or a huge paycheck or whatever. And I think, I'm gonna try and distill some of the lessons that I've learned. I've been doing this for 23 years, by the way. I started when I was eight years old. <laughs> so I suppose that's one of the lessons too, as you guys are saying, like, it doesn't, for anyone, it doesn't happen overnight. Like it's, if you're going to excel in your field, most likely you've put in, you guys have read the books about like 10,000 hours. Like you kind of don't master your field until you've done it for a really, really long time. <laughs> I mean, you can get lucky breaks, but, but often you don't feel confident enough to be creative until you've got a huge breadth of experience. And so, yeah, so I've been doing this for about 23 years. And I think the, the big things that I've learned Okay, how am I doing, by the way? Great. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that there are these flashy, punctuating moments in a career, these goals that you set. And they're, it's great to have goals, and it's great to have future-oriented goals because it keeps you motivated and invigorated and excited. But you can't wait to be happy, and you can't wait to feel fulfilled until you fulfill these goals. And I think a lot about, about the marathon story that you were talking about. Basically, for me, those, those moments are fleeting. Like you cross the finish line, and that's a day, but you've spent all this time training. Or you know, you might get an award, but you've spent a lot of time like waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> like most of your life is spent grocery shopping. <laughs> You know, and, and so if you're waiting for the booking the big job or getting the big paycheck or getting the trophy to feel that feeling that you've been wanting of fulfillment and, and affirmation, you're going to spend a lot of your life super unhappy. <laughs> and, um, and so really, I think based on what my parents did, which was cultivate this quality of life with nothing, I think I've really focused on trying to cultivate a quality in my life that uh, captures the essence of what I might be looking for if I got the thing I think I wanted, right? Like, if I want to be, if I want to be so happy and feel so affirmed and loved and fulfilled, just do that now. Just sit in my kitchen or brush my baby's teeth and feel that, and then. First of all, there's two ironies there. The one is that if you're already kind of vibrating in that frequency, if you've already got this feeling of like, I'm so happy and I've got so much joy and I have everything I want, I have gratitude, essentially, but I have, my family loves me and I love my family and it is raining and isn't that a miracle? <laughs> you know, like if you can cultivate that feeling of gratitude, then if you happen to get the phone call or the paycheck or the award, that's totally awesome, but you've already got the feeling, right? And so if it 
if it takes a little longer than you thought it was going to take, which it will, <laughs> you're okay. And your life isn't being wasted, like in the waiting room, hoping that you're going to have a good ride, right? And so, okay, so the two ironies that I wanted to talk about were one, that once you already start vibrating what I've found, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to couch this in, this is my experience. It might not be any of your experiences. It might be some of your experiences. Take what you like, leave the rest. This is my experience. <laughs> so when I'm vibrating the frequency of happiness and fulfillment and joy and gratitude, first of all, I'm far more likely to attract to me the kind of attention that I've been looking for and the kind of awards or the kind of promotions or jobs or, you know, the, the kinds of things I'm seeking are far more likely to come my way when I walk into a room being like, I'm so happy and life is great and I'm so grateful that I woke up this morning and I was alive. <laughs> Some people, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, like, you got to be grateful for all of it. And so you're more likely to attract the kind of attention you want. But then, so then, okay, so then you got the, the prize, and that's awesome. But then, the second irony is that, so then you finally get the prize. It doesn't feel that different, <laughs> because you've already cultivated the feeling. And so it's lovely. I'll tell you an example. My husband and I, he's a really wonderful, you guys should all marry my husband, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we do this thing, and wait for it because it sounds like one thing and then it's kind of another but basically whenever he whenever something big happens I and mean, he's a performer too he's a he's a musician and he does a lot his music independent of me has been featured on Grey's Anatomy five times <laughs> um, and he's now um, he's in a couple of bands one of them is called Circus Zero and it's with Andy Summers from the police and they are about to start touring um, but he, he does all sorts of musical things and basically the exercise that we do is when one of us kind of achieves a major goal or something wonderful happens in our careers or lives, we check in with each other. And Rob will say to me, he'll be like, so Katarina, how does it feel to have gotten this nomination or to have gotten this booking that you have so wanted? And I will seriously consider it. And I'll like check in with myself and I'll be like, same. And it's true. It, because what I'm saying is, it doesn't feel that different the moment after than it did the moment before. It might for a second, but then it's going to like equal out. And so you're going to feel essentially the same way after that you did moments before you got the prize. And so the thing is, you want to cultivate, you want to spend most of your life feeling like you got a prize. Because you did. Because here we are, and we're alive and healthy. and. Maybe not healthy, but alive and capable of love. You know? you know, like it's really, we super lucked out. I mean, the fact that we can be sitting here today is phenomenal. I mean, you saw this slideshow. I mean, there are people who are losing their lives in political protests and, and in hate crimes. And, you know, there are so many ways that we could be in a much worse situation than we're in. And so when we cultivate that feeling of gratitude and excitement about our situation, Yes, we're more likely to achieve things, and also we've achieved the ultimate, which is we've spent our lives really well. <laughs> um, okay, so that said, I have a list because <laughs> that might not have been what you showed up to hear. <laughs> so I do have a list of like Katarina's tips. Um, <laughs> that I just came up with. Um, but like they're kind of things that have served me well in my 23 odd years of doing this job and being like fairly steadily employed. Not always, so I'm unemployed right now, but you know. Uh, okay, so number one, I have 11. I'm gonna prepare you, there's 11. <laughs> uh, number one, never be late. It sounds so basic, but when you show up late, you have already placed yourself in debt. You're in a time debt to whoever it is that you're hanging out with. And so your attitude and your vibration is going to be different because you've created a really parents always tell me that. crappy situation for yourself emotionally. Don't be late, it's easy. Um, and then the second one is know your stuff. 
And all of these sound easy. They're harder to do. <laughs> when you know your stuff, you can relax. And when you can relax, you can get into flow. And when you can get into flow, you can be really creative. And you can actually have a joyful experience in doing whatever you're doing. You're more likely to get to the place that you want to be if you know your stuff. So just do it. Do the homework. Um, third is be nice to people. And that's like the golden rule, but it's also practical. If you create a, a friendly environment, first of all, people are going to give you what you give them. But also, you've created an atmosphere that is fear-free. And so you can actually go and be more creative because you're not worried that somebody's like, oh my god, she's such a bitch. <laughs> so let's just do it. It'll, it'll make it better for everyone, <laughs> including you. Um, try to learn names. It's simple, but people appreciate it so much. And for you, when you learn someone's name, you start to be aware that they have a whole story. They have challenges and accomplishments and a family and or no family and tragedies and and what when you humanize the people you're dealing with it's less scary you have a bunch of friends with you now instead of a bunch of people who are trying to get your stuff um, don't live beyond your means and so that's going to be different for everybody but essentially figure out what your number is and don't spend it <laughs> you know put your credit card in the freezer if you have to. Once you, when you're living beyond your means, you become enslaved to your financial situation. And you can no longer make creative decisions about what you want to do in your life because you have to pay that bill at a certain time. And again, you're indebted to someone. So don't live beyond your means. Floss. <laughs> I cannot say enough about dental hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> and that can be extrapolated to all sorts of different things. But basically, you do have to present yourself in a way that people want to engage with. If you have gingivitis, they don't want to hear your pitch. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, <laughs> seven is marry someone awesome. And the alternate is just don't marry someone not awesome. <laughs> if you can't find anyone awesome, just wait. <laughs> Uh, but they're like in your face every day, and you want to make sure that they're not um, they're not hurting your life. They're adding to your life. Um, okay, that leads. I'm going to skip eight and go straight to nine, which is that leads you to cultivate mutually uh, supportive relationships, and that's with coworkers and with friends and with spouses. Basically, um, what I do when I engage with someone. Afterwards, I scan my body and I go, wow, do I feel invigorated and ready to take on the world and excited and do I love myself? Or am I feeling like really drained and kind of angry and stressed out and nervous? And if that's the case, there are so many people, just make plans with someone else next time. You don't have to make a big deal of it or like break up with them. <laughs> just like go make other plans because we don't have time for toxic relationships. <laughs> and that's in all areas. Um, the next one is funny, I was going to say eat healthy and exercise because it really gives you much more stamina and as an actor, but with everyone, I really think stamina is like 75% of any job. You know, you can be brilliant, but it's a 14 hour day and you've got to be brilliant at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, and so, so physical health is, is part of the whole everything. Um, and now we're, we're already at 10. Gosh, this flew for me. How about you guys? <laughs> um, so 10. <laughs> I would say 10. I've kind of already covered, which is just be grateful. And that's, um, what did it, 8? 8 was be healthy enough to test. Um, 10 is be grateful. And, and again, it's especially when you're feeling really ungrateful. Especially when you're feeling like a victim or when you feel like somebody has done you wrong. That's when you sit down with your pen and paper and you make a list of 10 things that you can be grateful for and they can be as small as, I had fries at lunch and fries taste great, <laughs> to I'm so grateful that, you know, I got a scholarship to my graduate program. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, there's a great slogan that I've heard that is that it, it, 
it's almost impossible to feel grateful and unhappy at the same time. And so just try it. If you're unhappy, try replacing that feeling with gratitude and see what happens. And then the last one is 11. Maybe my moment of controversy, but I think, I think it really helps to find some God in your life. And it doesn't matter if you believe in one God or in 20 gods or in science with a capital S or in poetry or in group dynamics. Something bigger than you and your neurosis that can ground you in reality give you some perspective and remind you that there is something significantly larger and more important than that job interview. And that is pretty much, that pretty much sums up my nuggets that I've gathered so far. And I was integrated.